and welcome to another in our series of Living Your Best Life. I'm Patrice J. White, Guardian Life, Health and Wellness Ambassador, and today we're guarding our wealth. And as you know, I'm a health and fitness coach, but a part of living our best life is how we manage our money, but most importantly, how we invest our money so we can make more money. And here at Guardian Life, your money is in the best place for your life goals. To help us understand how we can invest and the many opportunities that are available for us, I have with us today a few financial experts who will join me in some robust conversation and informative discussions. First up, let's get this money mine. Kalila Renners, she's an award-winning business and financial journalist and Marcia Brown, insurance advisor here at Guardian Life Jamaica. Kalila, Marcia, welcome. Hi, <laughs> hi Pat, hi everybody watching. <laughs> I'm ready to get this money and to invest it with Guardian. Absolutely. <laughs> so Kaz, let's start with you first. All right. You have made investments understandable through your videos, but break it down for us a little bit further. What is an investment? And how can we spot an investment opportunity? All right, that's a great question, Pat. Mm -hmm. So an investment is anything that you do, and this is my definition, mm -hmm. it's not in the dictionary. An investment is anything that you do with the intention of improving upon that thing. Mm -hmm. So you can invest in your health, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to improve upon your health. So when you finish, and typically you really shouldn't finish you know, investing in your health, but at some point in the future, you should be better than you are than we today. Start. Right, mm -hmm. so you can invest time, Mm -hmm. which is a very valuable currency, by the yeah. way, because you can't get it back me. once it's Trust spent. Mm -hmm. You can invest your time, you can invest your money. For the purposes of this conversation, we're talking about investing your money. And we're typically looking at investing in financial assets or just assets that are going to increase in value over time. So once you start with it, the intention or the objective is to, for it to be worth more in the future than it is when you start the investment. So you can invest in things like stocks and bonds. These are tradable assets. Stocks are simply your share in a company. So you have a part ownership mm -hmm. in an established company. You can invest in your own business. Mm -hmm. You can invest in your education. You can invest in real estate, which is a very popular one as well. And, but the intention and the objective of an investment is that it's going to be worth more in the future than it is today. If you're buying a house just to live in, it may not necessarily be an investment. You may not be thinking of it as, a, as an investment property, right? Why? So depending on where you buy the house. Mm -hmm. So if you're buying a house without the objective of it being an investment, you could end up buying a house in a bad neighborhood and it loses oh. value. Mm. But if you're buying a house with the objective of it being an investment, you are looking for the price to go up in the future okay. or you are looking at it as maybe a rental property that you're going to earn income from mm -hmm. so how do you spot investment opportunities so you are looking for anything that you think is going to rise in value in the future mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about this some more risk appetite based on your risk profile how much risk you are comfortable taking so you can have a very conservative profile you don't want to lose no money so you can invest in things that are very uh, stable very secure have a long track record but typically low risk low reward high risk high reward mm -hmm. so you might not get a huge return from something if you're very conservative but you might be fine with that mm -hmm. as long as you don't lose your money you're happy right <laughs> And then you can look at things that are going to appreciate at a much faster pace. So you might want to look at investing in a company that's listed on the junior market, and we'll talk some more about that later as well. You might want to look at a company that's really in a rapid growth phase that is going to really appreciate and take off much faster than a more established company that's moving at a slower pace. They're not as aggressive. Or you might even consider cryptocurrencies, which is a uh, which is uh, <laughs> That's a whole other a whole conversation. Other conversation. We need exactly. To have. Mm, okay. This is a question for my young people. Mm -hmm. Why should they start investing from their very first paycheck? Wow, it's the benefit of time. 
So when you are young, you have the world of time ahead of you, and you can take a lot more risk when you are younger than when you are older. So if you are just starting at the age of 60, nothing is wrong with that. You can start whenever you want to, but you have to be a lot more conservative because you have uh, fewer years to play with. You don't have as much time. You might be looking to retire, and you don't want to take much risk with your money. If you are in your 20s now, you can take a, a whole heap of risk because you have time to recover in case it doesn't go, it doesn't work out as you intended. So start as early as you can. And then the other uh, benefit of starting young is that you have more years to compound your gains. So the more you invest at a younger age, the faster it will grow. And the benefit of time is going to increase your earnings exponentially. Okay, I like that. So you have an 18 year old that is- 19. <laughs> Well, I was more asking for my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But you have an 18-year-old that's going to college, you understand me, working, and you're not getting a full-on salary because you're going to college full-time and you're working part-time. How do you convince that 18-year-old to start investing from now for the future? Right, so I wish I had invested when I was in college because you know what was hot back then? Mm -hmm. Google and mm -hmm. Apple were way, way less expensive and Microsoft and Facebook was just starting. Facebook started when I was in college. Mm -hmm. I remember joining Facebook in 2004. Imagine if I had bought Facebook stock mm -hmm. at that time. They so you need to, though. right, so through the lens of history, we can look back and they say hindsight is 2020, and you can look back and say, wow, if I had done these investments at that time, where would I be now? I wouldn't even have to be here. I could be on an island somewhere sipping a margarita because I would just be taken care of because the stock market has uh, increased by so many times over that period of time. So for younger people who are just getting started, you may not be working full time, but you may have the benefit of having some parental support, mm -hmm. then whatever income you are able to make, you can put it towards an investment. And I know it's difficult when you're young because you want to spend and enjoy your money and enjoy your life, mm -hmm. but at least put some of it towards okay. an investment. So we can put away the notion of when it comes to investment, you don't have to start big. No, you can okay. start with whatever you have. And that's the beauty, especially here in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. There are some brokerage firms that let you open the investment account with no money at all. Okay. Just the, 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 the process of opening the account can be intimidating for some people. So you open the account and then you fund the account as you go on. Mm -hmm. And on the Jamaica Stock Exchange, compared to, let's say, stock exchanges in the United States, the stocks are relatively cheap. Mm -hmm. So you can get most stocks here for less than 100 Jamaican dollars each, okay. the vast majority of them. And you don't need to, you can start with a thousand JMD, five, whatever you have. The important thing is to start. Okay. All right. Well, I'm very, very big on generational wealth. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that I keep saying to my daughter, you understand me? Um, I'm not into, you know, Bertley's come, you know, you're buying gifts that two years down the line, you partly give one side. I believe that gifts should be shares, you understand me? Mm. So she can invest and stuff Brilliant. like that. Yes. Investment plans, you know, those things, etc. because we're, you know, thinking about generational wealth. All right, so the other question I have for you is, the financial world has become very diverse mm -hmm. with the introduction of blockchain, mm -hmm. NFT, crypto, and digital currencies. Why should we be paying attention? And this, <laughs> I need you to break it down as simple as you can because I do not understand anything that you just said exactly <laughs> I, I keeping it real when I see these conversations going on in the social space and you know Twitter you know you're out you know you're out hanging out with business executives having meetings and stuff you know me just tiptoe away because it, I'm not out of my comfort zone my idea of savings and investment is you go to the bank, you find out, you understand me? Mm -hmm. You know, what investment plans I have, you know, my call up Guardian, you understand me? And I'm like, hey, you, you know, tell me about the investment plans. You know, I want to put down some money in the future so when time I retire, you know, I can still live as right. I'm living now. Right. When I'm seeing these things, I, they're just above me. <laughs> Don't feel intimidated because, to be honest, I don't understand some of it myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I've still been doing a lot of reading, a lot of research, and many of these things are fairly new. 
uh, for example, Bitcoin has only been around for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. So, and we are like, in our 30s, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, going on 40s. 12 years is not that long for something to be around. NFTs are even newer than cryptocurrencies. So I'm still learning about NFTs myself. I still don't fully understand everything about it. But it is important to pay attention to because one, a lot of money is being made uh, regarding this. And two, they're increasingly becoming a part of our lives. Okay. So even though Bitcoin, I, to me, the value is in a store, as a store of wealth. So basically you purchase a Bitcoin and then you wait for the price to appreciate and then you can sell that asset and at a profit basically but it is also a tradable currency so people if you if you listen to the news in el salvador they made bitcoin a currency in their country so that you can pay for things in bitcoin oh. right so tesla also decided to accept bitcoin as payment for things and there are other like ethereum is another popular form of cryptocurrency and there i think amazon also accepts uh, some digital some cryptocurrencies as well and then here in jamaica the bank of jamaica is establishing a digital bank. currency mm -hmm. and not to be confused with cryptocurrency so the difference is that cryptocurrencies are not regulated by any bank anywhere which is why people are attracted to it but is that you look safe confused though, yeah is that safe though if well, it's not regulated how do i protect my investment that's part of the concern and that's why a lot of people are afraid of it but those who are uh, more of a risk taker mm -hmm. gravitate towards it because it's not regulated by any central bank but the the, the blockchain technology is what protects the transactions okay. right so the difference between a cryptocurrency and the digital currency that the Jamaican government is developing is that the central bank is developing is that the central bank regulates that digital currency so the digital Jamaican dollar or whatever they're gonna decide to call it is really a form of legal tender it's the same as the dollar that you have in your purse right now in your wallet just that it's a digital version and when you think about it when you go to the when you swipe your card there's no physical cash that changes hands True. so we're already operating in the spell of, uh, of digital, digital currencies world. per se mm -hmm. because you don't necessarily see all the money in your bank account when you spend it True. you're swiping or you're doing a funds transfer or various things and that's what that is but then cryptocurrencies like I said is this unregulated thing it is growing in popularity some countries well just one country so far has even adopted it and it can be seen as a store of wealth if you are a risk taker if you're not as risk averse as some people I'm afraid of the risk is yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do I do safe investments. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm still afraid. And of that's risk. good to know. So <laughs> knowing your investment profile mm -hmm. is extremely important. So okay. you want to do things that align with your goals, mm -hmm. with your core values. So if you know that you're conservative, <laughs> then you might not want to go into crypto, okay. or you might not want to go into some more high-risk investments. Okay. How do you think these changes will in impact investment opportunities? Right, so when we're looking at the, the digital world and everything that is coming, like right now, uh, NFTs are huge in the art world. And like I said, I still don't fully understand NFTs, mm -hmm. but what they essentially do is they attach a value to a form of digital art, right? And you are able to store that transaction on the blockchain. But what a lot of businesses are doing now and artists are doing is attaching some type of other value to the thing. So let's say I do a digital portrait of Patrice, mm -hmm. right? And I decide to sell that digital portrait as an NFT. You could get a benefit from owning that digital portrait because my issue with NFTs is if I buy the digital portrait, what is to stop other people from having copies of the digital portrait? Like it's still, it's, it's, it is duplicatable. Other mm -hmm. people can have it. I just paid a whole heap of money for it, but what's the real value for me? Mm -hmm. But what businesses have been doing now is getting savvy with it and they can say, okay, Patrice, you have your digital portrait that you've sold. It's an exclusive design, but owning it also entitles you to free consultation with Patrice. Oh. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's how a lot of businesses are starting to use the technology mm -hmm. in their business and okay. to use it to create wealth. 
Interesting. All right. What are some of the basic practices for daily wealth management that could help our investment appetite? Right. Like me. <laughs> you know, you know, I heard you said it earlier, you know, 30s, you know, we're in our 30s. I really wish I was in my 30s, but you know, I'm 42. <laughs> you understand me? And I want when I'm when I'm at 60, if I choose not to in the gym pumping, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I could be chilling somewhere on the beach, yeah. you know, watching, you know, my passive income earnings, stuff like that, you mm -hmm. understand me? Well, it's the same thing that you preach, Patrice, mm -hmm. consistency. Mm. So consistency in the gym is going to get you results. Little, little, you, you might not see everything one day, but mm -hmm. a couple months from now, people will start noticing the difference. A year from now, you'll see a huge transformation if you are consistent daily. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes for saving and investing. A little bit a day or a week or a month can mm -hmm. take you a long, long way. So a lot of people start and then they just leave it and forget. Mm -hmm. But what I encourage people to do is to do like maybe a salary deduction. Because you know, when you have a salary deduction, you don't even really notice when the money come out of your pocket, you know. Yeah, but you, you know, just, you learn to live on the rest. How is it rough, you know, mm -hmm. with the cost of living and all these it things, is. you understand me? It is, so which is exactly why you need to do it. You hear where inflation reached now nearly 10%? Wow. Nearly 10%. Wow. And if you are putting that money in a savings account, you are basically losing money to inflation. If you're putting it under your mattress, you're losing money to inflation. So basically, you have to think long term. You where have to link, You have to think long term and be consistent with it. So at least once a month, put aside some money from your For monthly us income. Entrepreneurs, you know, entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur also. You know the entrepreneurship business. Mm -hmm. This month is a good month. You, you probably have tamarind season for two, three months. You mm -hmm. understand me? So a lot of entrepreneurs who don't invest or don't even want to partake in the conversation of, in, of investing will say to you that their earning is not consistent. consistent. Mm -hmm. So why are they going to invest when they, you know, they don't have a regular, you know, regular funds coming in? So you don't How necessarily do you them to you don't necessarily have to do it monthly. You can mm -hmm. do it as a percentage of whatever income you make. So okay. if you're getting paid $100,000 for a job, then you can say, I'm going to put aside 5%. Every time I get paid for whatever, mm -hmm. I'm going to put aside 5% into my investment account. Okay. So if it's not a monthly salary, mm -hmm. just set a, set a percentage and mm -hmm. put aside that percentage out of every time you get a paycheck. Okay. All right. As a financial journalist, tell me the industry or industries that are booming right now. Right. So there's a lot going on in the space right now. Uh, the manufacturing and distribution industries have shown that they have weathered the COVID storm fairly well. They have done fairly well in the past two years. They have grown. But more specifically for the, in the Jamaican context, the junior market companies have been doing very well. And the junior market simply refers to the smaller companies that are listed on the stock exchange. So you okay. have your big companies mm -hmm. and you have smaller companies. And these are the ones that are valued at 500 million or less Jamaican dollars, which is about, what, 350,000 US, I think? No, 3.5 million. Uh, don't quote me on that. I think right. it's about 3.5 so million. the smaller companies are valued 500 million Jamaican dollars? Yes, okay. or less, or less. <coughs> so, if I'm not in the 500 million Jamaican dollars range, that means uh, I'm just right down there. I'm not, I'm not no, touching no, the small company. No, that's the maximum. <laughs> oh, okay. That's the okay, maximum, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. right. So, okay. once you pass 500 million, then you go on the main market of okay, the stock exchange, okay. mm -hmm. right? So, right. It's, there are a lot, some of them are much smaller than the 500 million. Okay. But why there is so much opportunity in the junior market is that these are the companies that are at their growth stage. They're very aggressive. They mm -hmm. want to build, they want to grow, they want to get to the 500 million and beyond. And so they are growing a lot faster than the companies on the main market. Mm -hmm. So there's opportunity there, but there's also more risk. And we spoke about risk as well because they're not as established. So if you're not a company that's as established, that has a 20, 25, 30, 50 year track record, mm -hmm. there is more risk because you might be new, you might have a company for two years. We've even had startups that listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Startups are risky, but there is also huge growth potential if you are willing to take that risk. Okay, okay. All right, thank you, Kaz. Mm -hmm. um, this is really good information. So like me, who is not a risk taker, you know I'm going to be pulling on you 
for a little bit more guidance. Anytime. All right. So I want you to go back a little bit on stocks and shares and bonds. Explain that to me. Um, and I'm sure, you know, there are persons who are watching also who want a little bit more clarification. So I am an owner of Guardian. Mm -hmm. And when I tell people I'm an owner of Guardian, they are like, what part, you know, the CEO? I'm mm -hmm. like, I have shares in Guardian. Exactly. You understand me? So if I have shares in Guardian, then I'm an owner of the company. Right. Um, so when I just went into buying shares, I just buy it because I expect when I'm selling it, I'm earning more than what I purchase it for. Right. Then I start getting little checks. Yeah. I never know mm, that dividends. I get money. Yeah, mom, I dividends. Never know that I get yes. little money. So explain that to me because you know, me don't forget some proper explanation. I'm still not get it. Right. Um, and too many I want people to know some head be tough. <laughs> but just all right, I understand. But explain that to me because I thought that when I bought the shares, you understand me, I pay X dollars for it. Mm -hmm. My earnings for it is going to be when I sell that share. Right. Um, and that's it. I was at no point in time I was expecting to be getting checks. Mm -hmm. So there are two, and you're absolutely right, there are two primary ways that you make money from investing. One is through price appreciation, which is what you described, mm -hmm. that you would sell the stock for more than you paid for it mm -hmm. at whatever point in time. So that's price appreciation. It's also called capital appreciation. It's also called gains or capital gains. And then number two is dividends. So dividends are simply your share of a company's profits. So okay. if a company is profitable, they may declare a dividend, and the dividends are paid to all shareholders of the company. Guardian, please continue making profit because <laughs> I want to collect much more dividends. <laughs> but a dividend isn't guaranteed. So mm. when you're investing in a company, you want to look at what their dividend policy is. Especially oh. if you're investing in, and we spoke about the junior market companies, mm -hmm. companies that are in that growth phase, they may prefer to reinvest their profits into the company mm -hmm. so that they can continue growing rather than paying out a dividend to shareholders. Oh. So it's something that you want to, to consider. Yeah. Put a pause right there, Carrie. So if I am going to buy a share in a company, it is best for me to also look at or it is that they pay out dividends. Right. Because so, that will also guide me in terms of, um, what's the correct word um, in terms of finance? Um, the potential of the company. Right, right. So, not, <laughs> so not all companies pay okay. dividends. So mm -hmm. you do want to look at the dividend policy. And what is your objective in purchasing the shares? Are you looking for, uh, for passive income? Are you looking for regular dividends? Then you want to seek out those companies that pay regular dividends. If I'm looking for passive income, then I need to go for regular dividends. You, yeah, that could be one strategy that okay. you use. Thank you, Kaz. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I've learned a lot of information Yay. from you. Um, this information serves as a roadmap towards our investments. Oh, it is that we're going to save some more, invest some more. And my map is leading me to speak to Marcia. Because... <laughs> I now know, I now know how to make the investment. Mm -hmm. You understand me? But more I know the investment products that we can invest in now, don't it? Absolutely. All right. <laughs> so, Marcio, you're a financial advisor here at Guardian. Yes. And as you know, every miku, make a moku. You understand me? And as I said it earlier with Carl's, you know, I am one of those safe investors. Yes. You know, because we careful. Yes. The little mickle yeah. when I have to go down the yes. drain. So, how much should I start with? And realistically, um, what can I get with that amount that I start with? All right. First, to begin with, Guardian Life has a suite of solutions or products that has an investment component attached. So the majority of them, like about 98% of our products, has sure, has investments attached. And the minimum that one can start with, listen to this now, mm -hmm. you can start with $500 on the investment component mm -hmm. of your life insurance policy. And we have, um, there are those that the minimum is $1,000 as well. Mm -hmm. But as you can imagine that what you gain is predicated on how you invest. The more you can set aside for investment is the more you gain. However, what we have recognized though is that we would like as much persons as possible to start saving. As Kalila said, start where you can. Start from your young, start small. 
So this is why we made the, the flooring of our investments $500 or there are some products where you start mandatorily at $1,000. And what happens is that over time, as clients are able to, depending on disposable income, they can gradually increase. Oh, nice. So say, for example, somebody takes out a plan that is um, primarily for, they would like that policy for family income protection or uh, a life insurance policy is their core function because they want something that, um, that can help their family should they pre predecease their beneficiaries, right? So that would be their their core reason for buying life insurance, but that policy also has the investment component attached, and that is what um, clients really love about the policies. It's really holistic. So it gives a living benefit as mm -hmm. well as a death benefit, because in times past, you know, that a lot of policies back in the day didn't have any savings. But mm -hmm. now with the evolution of um, insurance, we do now have the majority of our plans with investments. So what happens is that the client can start with a minimum $500 and over time, at any point in time, mm -hmm. they can come and say to their advisor or say to me, boy, Marcia, I'm earning a little bit more now. So can I put it to, say, $2,000 a month or $3,000 a month? And say, for example, their overall premium might be, say, 10000 a month. What will happen is that at 3000 a month, that is on the investment side, goes into an investment fund. Mm. And we have um, good, um, we have segregated funds mm -hmm. that the investments can be invested in from our portfolio team. We have plans where the investments are in five segregated funds where clients will have an option to put their money in, in one of these funds or mm -hmm. more than one. Um, the funds are foreign currency, money market, equity, real estate, stabilization fund. And we do have an additional plan, which is primarily set up for investment that it has an additional fund, which is a Crown Eagle fund. So those funds have been performing. And of course, um, depending on what is happening in the economic landscape, the, the funds will go up and down and so on. But we get from our portfolio team every single month how the funds perform. We get a report. Okay. So when we take our clients' money, whether it's the 500 or the 1,000 or whatever it is, we can competently allocate the clients' money b b based on the performance report that we get from our portfolio team every month. And that is pretty, that gives us, it makes, gives us um, good instruction mm -hmm. as to how to do the investments. I love that. So I want to tie it back into something that um, Carl said. Right. Um, Cause you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so you know, everything I'm gonna, you know, Kalila is defending the nine to five, you know, the salary workers, I have to defend the entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, so let's put it into a project perspective. Mm -hmm. I have started a $500 investment portfolio. Um, and over time I keep, you know, putting in money in it, etc. But then I get this nice project and from the project, I don't want to, you know, squander the money that I'll get. So I take a percentage from that. I can then come to come to you guys and say, hey, I want to add this to my investment fund. Absolutely. We have that um, capability where guys, clients can come in or anybody mm -hmm. can come in and put a lump sum okay. on their investment. And what that does is to where clients can't commit to uh, consistency as it relates to monthly payments. I like that. Say they it again, can, Marcia. Where clients can't commit to a monthly payment mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. they, if, m meaning a monthly payment plan of, say, a, a bigger amount, mm -hmm. they can continue with their $1,000 every month, but every now and then, they get, the they lump get a lump sum. Some persons, I have some clients who probably join a partner, because mm -hmm. you know a lot of our people here join yeah. partner, and I will say to you guys, when you get your partner draw, see if you can come in with a portion of it and just put it on as a lump sum. I like and that. And that will help with the returns that you will get. I like that. Yes. So investments now sound very exciting Absolutely. to me. Absolutely. I, I don't know if I can take the receipt in and go, you understand <laughs> me? I'm still going to keep it safe. But how do we know which investment plan is for, is for us? How do we know which, is, which one is the right one? All right. So first of all, what we do, we don't sell plans in isolation. We don't sell plans willy-nilly like that. Just to 
sell somebody a client comes and you just give them this what we do we have a discussion with the individual because what we do is need based selling so the thing is that your need may be different from Kalila's need mm -hmm. so what we do is a fact finding um, discussion okay. we first um, identify if they have another financial in their financial portfolio they may have um, similar um, products that we possibly would like to offer we would also look at um, what it is that their medium short and long-term goals are and the most critical thing is that we have to look at what their disposable income is at the end of the day oh. what they, they, their income versus their expenditure because mm -hmm. really we don't want to give somebody a product that they can't afford two three more four months down the road so it's critical to identify the need coming out of that discussion and um, what we will do is give them something that it will benefit them now and also that same solution can benefit them down the road. Because when they say that they are short -term to medium term goals, probably they're going to go back to school in another three years or they want to look at something for their retirement mm -hmm. or they want to fund their child's education down the road. Okay. You will have to look at or they want something to deposit on a home. Mm -hmm. So those things are what will come to play in us really um, recommending the, the, the solution that they would be their investment plan. And then we also, in collaboration with our port investment portfolio team, seek guidance sometimes because they will also say to, I will call them from time to time and say, hey, I have a client who wants to invest X amount. Give me some um, information as to how you think the funds will perform. I want to put it on estate, real estate or equity. Can you give me some guidance here based on the amount of money? Then? And so this is how we um, operate where we can ensure that the client will get the most out of their investments. So that's really how we have So to basically once I come here, mm -hmm. I'm covered. Absolutely. My advisor, make sure so make them take sure. care of me. All right. So you, you, you mentioned something, and because you mentioned that, um, I want you to tell me about Guardians, the products that Guardians have that are available, mm -hmm. the products and services that are available. And when you're talking about that, I want you also to tell me the one that's available for college funds. <laughs> you understand me? All right. So I'm happy that you, you brought that to the fore because we are just launching, we're about to launch our new Guardian Achiever plan nice. which is a college education plan which is supposed to come on stream sometime next month nice. where the, the when the child is one year old that policy can be taken out for that child and the payout is at age 18 just when we're thinking that the child will get into college and the payout is a fantastic thing absolutely you hear that guys yes when the child is one year old you can start that plan so when you reach 18 years of age and college drop in place you know, so you can just go back to it because the funds are available now. Yes. And also, the fantastic thing is that the coverage amount on the life of the child will be paid out, I think it's three times the amount of coverage. So say the parent takes out, say, about a five million coverage on the child. At 18, 15 million would be paid out, plus some money that is earned on the end. There's also a side for investment as well. So that plan will also have an investment component as well. Nice. So whatever is earned on the investment will be paid out on top of that amount of money. And that plan will continue with the child for the rest of the child's life. Nice. It also carries a critical illness plan for the child as well. Nice. So that's a fantastic plan. As soon as it is rolled out, the whole of Jamaica will be, will be, will be ready for, for that. And we look forward to And I'll to be that. right here pushing that yes, plan for you guys. Absolutely. Trust me. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, a mm. lot of, uh, you know, Carl, I know you'll agree with me with this. We need to get out of the idea of generational curse. Mm -hmm. It's all about building wealth. And that's why we're here today to talk about how it is that we can build wealth going forward. But tell me about the rest of Guardian's product. All right. So. Um, we also have critical illness plans. Mm -hmm. We have a new ultimate provider, which was, we revised it last year, where that plan covers, it covers 23 critical illnesses. But listen to this now. When the client, if the client does not make a claim prior to age 75, 
when they get to age 75, 50% of that coverage will be paid out. Normally, you don't pay, out, uh, you don't pay out a coverage until the client makes a claim or until there's, there's death. 50 percent. 50 percent of the I coverage. I never know that you can get back money from yeah, insurance. Absolutely. <laughs> I never yes, know it, yes, it was just revised um, last year. So, say for example, you take out a critical illness plan for ten million dollars. You don't make a claim when you get to age seventy-five. Fifty percent of that will be paid out. So you'll get five million dollars. Mm -hmm. And if you want to take money from, and it also has an investment component as well. Nice. So even prior to that. Say something happens and you are in dire straits, we don't really encourage persons to keep drawing down on the investments because, as you know, you can't beat the benefit of compounded effect. Right. Mm -hmm. So what, when, I, when I sell that product, we put on an inve the investment, we ask the client how much is it that you want to set aside for investment as well, which they can also increase on that policy. They can also put a lump sum on that policy as well on the investment side. So in the event that anything should happen, they can draw down on it, and their critical illness coverage is still safe and in place. But when they get to age 75, if they don't make a claim prior to that, then 50% will be paid out, and the balance will remain on the policy mm -hmm. until death. That's, that's fabulous. And listen, it also carries a disability benefit, which is another living benefit apart from the investment and the 50% payout. So in the event that the client Yes, totally and permanently disabled, oh, no, or they lose fine. digits or partially disabled, mm. a payout is, is, is made as well. And that would have to have been determined from the outset when they take up that policy. Mm -hmm. And the thing too is with that plan is that the client has an option to increase it on the anniversary every year. So mm. when the policy is being taken out, the client is advised that this is an option and they can advise the advisor or tell the advisor that they want to increase the coverage by 10, 15, 20%. So every year on the policy's anniversary, the coverage is increased. So say they take out $5 million and they say they want 20% each year. So 20% will, will be put on the 5 million and so on and so forth. So it will be gradually increased without the client have to be applying again for more coverage or... I love that. Right. I love that. So, so that's for the critical illness we also have, and that has to be an underwritten plan, so that you may have to do a medical or whatever it is. Okay. And that has to be approved by our underwriters, but we also have non-medical critical illness plan, mm -hmm. where it's not approved by an underwriter, but you'll have to be in a, a safe, healthy space nonetheless. And that is, covers 10 critical illness. And the major ones included in both are cancer, stroke, heart attack. But it also Thank has blindness, much. coma, Repeat and so for on. me again, Marcia. Repeat for me again. The major ones are cancer, stroke, heart attack. Thank you very much. That one covers 10 illnesses. And after 20 years, if you don't make a claim, then Guardian will refund you all of your premiums that you pay over the 20 years. Khalil, are you hearing that? Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win <laughs> for the client. If they make a claim, then the money is paid out. If they don't make a claim, after 20 we'll years, Guardian money. Life will give you back. Nice. So you don't lose. Because a lot of times persons will come and say, boy, my money will go down the drain if I don't Get make sick. a claim. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, they're, and they're skeptical. And I say, no, it's a win-win for you, the client. Because if I you like don't it. make a claim, you'll get back your money, I so like you're not losing. It. Like so it. it's, a, it's a fantastic deal. And not to mention the suite of life insurance products that we offer that clients can look at for the family income protection should the main breadwinner predecease the beneficiary that coverage is paid out. And those policies also have investment and disability benefits as well. So we have everything for everybody. And as I had said before, you start small and, we, we, and I encourage young persons as well, take out a life insurance policy when you're young. You pay far less, you are able to pass a medical should you take out when that When you say plan. young, what age do you mean? So I need to take out one of my daughter now then? Absolutely, you can take that out. All right. And so you, you know, would be the owner. And it, absolutely, yes. <laughs> so Marcia, everything you mentioned, you keep saying investment. So my question to you is, is my insurance an investment? Absolutely. Without a doubt, your insurance is an investment because... The truth of the matter is I look at it sometimes as a legacy that you mm -hmm. leave for your family. 
but it's also an investment to help to enrich your life as well. We're talking about wealth creation and because oh. our insurance solutions, a part of our solutions has that investment component. It actually helps you as it relates to your wealth. You can look at it, as I mentioned before, an investment in even your own education because you can want to go back to school in another two, three or whatever years. And you can look at our solution as something that you can invest in to help to fulfill that goal. And also an investment in your family, family's future, mm -hmm. in the event that something should happen to you, unfortunately, then they are okay. They are okay for, for life. And that's why I, I, I use the word as a legacy. Okay. Because a lot of kids, grandchildren, mm -hmm. their grandparents invested in life insurance before instead of an estate. Mm -hmm. They named them as beneficiaries and down oh. the road. Yes, and down the road, oh. they, they, they are... They are wonderful benefactors of, of, of so life insurance. I just want to make sure. So basically, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong. So basically, I can transfer my investment to my kids. Absolutely. Or a family member. Yes. Ah, ah, I like that, I like that, I like that. All right. So where do we start the process? Online or do we need to come in, per in branch in person? All right. So we are working on an online um, Online, we're launching an online platform where persons can buy life insurance. Mm -hmm. So that is not on stream yet. But currently what we do is have our advisors can go to the client, whichever is convenient for them, to sign documents and they have to submit documentation and so on. So for now, um, we have it face-to-face um, -face okay. where we meet with clients. So the clients can either come in office to us mm -hmm. or we meet our clients um, off-site. Thank you so much, Marcio, for telling us about Guardian's product and something that we might miss when we have those conversations with our investment um, officer. We're taking a break, and when we come back, we'll be speaking with our VP of Investments, Michael Parker. Should critical illness strike, don't let worry fill your head. Say hello to happiness and goodbye to worry with Guardian Life's new Ultimate Provider Plan. Secure your medical expenses in the event of critical illness ahead of time while benefiting from our investment portfolio and so much more. Give yourself and your family the peace of mind you deserve with Guardian Life's new Ultimate Provider Plan today. And live secure, live easy. Welcome back to Guardian Wealth. My name is Patrice J. White, and we're talking about investments and how they can help us live our best life. We have learned a lot from our financial journalist, Kalila Reynolds, and also our very own Marcy Brownie, financial advisor. Now we speak with Michael Parker, VP for investments here at Guardian Life Limited. We will go even further into the opportunities available here at Guardian. <laughs> Michael, what are the different funds available for Guardian policyholders to invest in? And tell us how they are different. Thanks for having me, Patrice. Thank you. Um, so Guardian has many options available for um, policyholders to invest in mm -hmm. um, through their policies. So we have six um, that we're currently offering. Um, we have our Guardian Money Market Fund, a Guardian Stabilization Fund. Um, we have a long-term growth, a capital growth, and an equity fund. Okay. What type of assets are included in the funds that are managed here by Guardian? Okay, so we have a number of assets um, in terms of including it in the portfolios so that we pretty much take the trouble or the stress out of selecting assets from you, the policyholder. So we do that ourselves. So we have a wide range of assets. Um, they're local um, in terms of local bonds. We have foreign bonds. We have equities. Um, we also have foreign currency investments um, invested in those portfolios. So it pretty much covers the gamut. Okay. All right. How can a policyholder determine which fund they should invest in? Okay. That's a very good question. So that is going to be dependent on the risk tolerance of the policyholder. I don't know. There's no need to look. <laughs> no, no, there's no need for that at all. So what we're just saying is that we just need to know what are your investment objectives. 
Um, so persons may have, you know, wanting to preserve capital. That could be one. They may want income or they may want growth. So really and truly, it's just for you to understand that um, dynamic to determine what is right for you. Um, in terms of just looking at, say, the option of capital growth um, versus income preservation, that would determine if you look at more funds that have fixed income components. So our garden money market fund, our stabilization fund, which are more um, less volatile funds, you don't have the volatility the up and down, um, that is a more suitable fund for someone who is more risk averse. Um, we have other options, um, which are our garden equity, garden long term, garden um, capital growth, um, which offer investments in equity investments as well as real estate and other more risk, riskier assets. Um, but of course, with risk comes higher return, so it's a trade off between risk and return. Well, you know, I'm afraid of the risk thing, now, so you know, I just go with any, any investment I'm doing, it's always secure. Okay. But the thing is, you know, um, risk, there's no need to be fearful of risk mm -hmm. um, because there are things that you can do to diversify away the risk. Okay. And we do that at Guardian for you. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that we can look and see, okay, how do we diversify the portfolio? And diversification is just a simple concept. It just means don't, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to have one particular asset that's going to be in the portfolio that can significantly swing oh. You know the movement mm -hmm. of the unit prices and I neglected to mention that the funds that we offer are actually unitized funds so how that works is that policyholders purchase units in the fund mm -hmm. so when you purchase units those funds are accumulated and we then take those monies and invest in financial assets mm -hmm. and then the income from those assets then go towards increasing the unit price and that benefits policyholders okay all right so which Guardian product would you recommend for me? I'm interested in, uh, when I'm sleeping, I know I'm earning money. I'm always interested in passive income. So for, s for the passive income earner, which other Guardian product would you match that person with? Well, in terms of the investment funds, mm -hmm. um, the stabilization fund or the money market fund, as we spoke about earlier, mm -hmm. those are the more risk averse um, funds that we offer. Safe so you can me. sleep well at night. <laughs> um, there is no cause for concern at all. Mm -hmm. Um, but as it relates to, you know, looking at more riskier assets or in terms of looking for a higher rate of return, um, certainly, given your age, because I can see that you're not at age, uh, one minute past 25, I'm sure. Oh God, I love so <laughs> I know that you um, could look at taking additional risk. And that's the thing that we look at when we're looking to see, you know, what funds do persons invest in. Mm -hmm. We look at things as your age, mm -hmm. investment horizon in terms of, do you have any particular um, milestone that you're trying to achieve um, in the next five to 10 years? Because these are all things that are, gonna, that are gonna actually impact the actual fund that you choose to invest in. So we have to get a full sum understanding and that's why it's very important for you to have a discussion with your investment advisor or your insurance advisor mm -hmm. to determine what's the best fund for you. Okay. What are the risks involved in Guardian investment funds? Okay, so in the main, the main risk, because these are unitized funds mm -hmm. and policyholders pretty much are taking a portion of the investment risk that, you know, the entire fund holds, um, the main risk would be market risk. Okay. And that pretty much is the risk that prices of the financial assets could decline in value mm -hmm. and that could negatively impact the unit prices. Oh, okay. But as I indicated before, diversification is one way of mitigating that. Um, but you do run the risk, as we have all seen in the case of the pandemic, mm -hmm. that there will be times when all asset classes will just suffer. So in 2020, we realized that and we saw that. So there's no amount of diversification that can pretty much insulate you from that. So that's why we always tell investors and policyholders that when you're looking to invest in these funds, you should have a timeline of at least five to 10 years at the very minimum. It allows you to benefit um, from any short-term fluctuations that could occur mm -hmm. in the unit prices. Okay, so it's not a matter of investing in something in 2022 and expecting the reward in 2023, 2024. No, um, so I mean, investors always want to get high rates of return in short periods of time, which is an unrealistic <laughs> expectation. Um, it can happen. But what we tend to tell persons is that you have to have the long-term horizon in terms of looking for the five to 10-year horizon 
um, if you're investing in any other funds that have any exposure to say equities or bonds because you can have that movement short-term movement up or downwards in prices and that can not allow you to achieve some of the objectives that you may have in the short term and if we look at the Jamaica stock market mm -hmm. um, if you look at the return say in 2020 when we had the pandemic the return was down negative 23 percent um, last year which is 2021 the return was one percent doesn't sound very attractive mm -hmm. but if you look over the long term the average rate of return annualized um, for the last 10 years was about 15.5% on the Jamaica stock market index. So in the long term, you're much, much better off in terms of withstanding these short-term fluctuations that can impact your portfolio. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So Michael, once you have risk, you must have returns, don't mm -hmm. it? Because Definitely. You must have, I'm only interested in the return part. No, cool. If there are risks, there must be returns. What have the returns on investments fund been like historically? So the returns on the fund have been good. So last year, um, which was 2021, the funds that we managed, the returns would have ranged between 3 and 10% um, last year. Um, and I think that was creditable given the fact that this is the year after the pandemic. Well, we're um, still in it, man, Michael. We're still in it, exactly. <laughs> um, but we tend not to focus on the one year. So we always tell our policyholders to look more at the five to ten year window in terms of looking at the return over that period of time mm -hmm. because that's going to give you a better indication as to the long term um, returns that you're generating on the portfolio. And that I think is what is really critical um, for policyholders because we know how it is. We all have objectives. We all have goals and these investments are here to meet those goals. So once we know that, look, you know, yes, we may have a pandemic and the return may be down in this one year, mm -hmm. but our expectation is that, you know, over the longer period of time, five years, 10 years, 15 years, because when we're selling life insurance policies, those are the times of durations that we're looking at. You had spoken about, you know, trying to, you know, generate savings to take care of educational expenses. Persons may want to, you know, acquire houses, cars. You have retirement. many retirement. retirement. You have many different options in terms of what persons are trying to achieve. Um, so we always focus on the longer term returns um, for the funds. Okay. And Patricia, I just wanted to pick up on something that Marcia had brought up as it relates to, you know, how early you could start saving um, in terms of a product that we offer. Um, we do have the Guardian Achiever mm -hmm. um, and that allows for early ages in terms of starting from mm -hmm. age one. And the reality is the early start mm -hmm. um, you benefit from the power of compounded rates of return. Yes, dear Michael, I know about that, but continue to tell the people. I'm exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, Albert Einstein said that, you know, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world, mm -hmm. and it really is, because if it is that you were to start investing um, from that age, the benefit of the compounded rates of return um, is just so significant. I myself know um, this firsthand because my father was a life insurance agent, and he ah. actually took out a policy for me ah. when I was just born. And just in terms of being able to be knowledgeable of that mm -hmm. and actually going and investing um, routinely, whether it be monthly, semi-annually, you can see the tangible value down the road of starting early. So nice. if it's one thing that I want to just recommend and suggest that everyone do yeah. is to start as early as you can. Mm -hmm. If you can't, if you haven't started as yet, I mean, now is as good a time as any to start. So <laughs> please. Wow. I need to call my guardian advisor right now. Because you know, I'm going to sort out my 2022 investments because we're talking about generational wealth, future wealth, retirement wealth, anything on your wealth, that's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> All right. I hope that you too have learned about the best way to make your investments. And we encourage you to choose Guardian for all your investment goals. Thanks to my panelists, Kalila, Marcia, and Michael. And to you, our viewers, for watching Guardian Wealth. I'm Patrice J. White, your health and wellness ambassador, wishing you your best life. Mm -hmm.